starts right now. We begin tonight with an alarming update on the recent surge of COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. Metro Health confirming four new deaths today, as well as 230 new positive cases. That is the highest report for a single day ever. Those new cases bringing our total to 4,242. Hospitalizations also on the rise. Right now, there are 148 positive patients being treated here locally, 58 in the ICU and 26 on ventilators. Local health official, officials say our area's daily positivity rate has doubled from just one week ago. It's part of a surge not just here at home, but across the state. Texas saw more than 2,000 new cases just today with another 18 deaths. Our other top story, eight people shot and a gunman still on the loose tonight. San Antonio police say that gunman opened fire outside of Rebar. That's a local bar located off Broadway on the north side. At the scene, Chief William McManus said the suspect began shooting after he was denied entry to the bar, allegedly because he was drunk. Our hearts go out to those victims injured and affected by this senseless act of rage. It is hard to really to express the sadness that we feel and pray they all make a full recovery. All eight people who were shot are expected to survive. Police are now reviewing surveillance video, trying to figure out who that gunman is. Witnesses say he called himself a UFC fighter. Meanwhile, neighbors living in the area say they're frustrated with their backyard bar scene. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with a few of them about the changes they'd like to see. It's just scary just because, I mean, when I was in my house, I heard the gunshots go off. Just absolutely crazy. Who, who, who would think, go back to your truck or vehicle, get a rifle and come back and start shooting? That, that's just barbaric. Residents in this neighborhood say they're on edge after gunmen opened fire, injuring eight people at Rebar on Broadway. San Antonio police say the suspect was refused entry to the bar because he was drunk and retaliated. Those living nearby say this shooting only adds to their frustrations with this bar scene. People parking in their yards, um, litter and that kind of thing, but primarily noise complaints. District 10 Councilman Clayton Perry says the issue is not with rebar specifically, which has made upgrades like soundproofing and screening patrons before they enter. He says the complaints are for the bars across the street. With the music and the crowds and all that, Yes, it does create some nuisance problems there. Neighbors say things have gotten so chaotic after hours with the bar scene that they've had gates built around their front doors to keep people who are under the influence trying to get in out. Yes, yeah, some people have come in our yard and like gone to the bathroom, but then there was another situation where there was one guy who he was in our backyard and he was trying to I don't know what he was doing, but it was just a really scary thing to see that someone jumped our fence. Residents say they want the bars to pay closer attention to avoid overserving. Your responsibility doesn't go away just because somebody walks out the door. Councilman Perry says he hopes to have more discussions addressing the concerns of residents, including possibly adding more police patrol in the area. Maybe there can be some signage, that kind of thing, to let people know, hey, this is right next to a neighborhood, and to be considerate. Now, Rebar is back open this evening, and the bar scene along the street, very active. Now, San Antonio police is still searching for the suspect responsible for putting eight people in the hospital. They're asking anyone with any information that can help in this investigation to call authorities immediately. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. New on the night beat, a woman was killed this afternoon when the car she was riding in was involved in a three-vehicle crash. It happened just before 5.30 on MLK and Walters. It's still unclear what caused the wreck, but we know it involved a Hummer and two smaller vehicles. A woman in one of those smaller vehicles was pronounced dead at the scene. Another woman was taken to the hospital, but she's expected to be okay. Two people in the Hummer took off running after the crash, but were later found by police. We're still working to find out what charges they're facing. Other top stories we're following for you this evening. Authorities say a woman who was shot by a security guard in the parking lot of a sports bar overnight has died. It happened early this morning at the fourth quarter sports bar on Wurzbach Road. Police say a group of women were asked to leave after becoming belligerent. When they tried to drive away, their vehicle crashed into a parked car, and that's when a security guard tried to stop them, but was then overrun in that process. Another security guard then pulled his gun, firing towards the vehicle, hitting one woman inside. She later died at the hospital. The security guard who was run over was hospitalized but is expected to survive. So far, we're told no arrests have been made. A man is in critical condition after being hit by a vehicle while trying to cross the street around 3 this morning. It happened on Main and Euclid Avenue. 
Police saying a truck hit him in the middle of the road and then drove away. Officers say the man was homeless. No arrests have been made. Arson investigators are looking into the cause of a fire at an east side duplex this morning. That fire started around 9 on South Olive Street near Iowa. Investigators say the building was under construction and no injuries were reported. All Black Lives Matter. That message from a group of protesters downtown San Antonio today. Yeah, they marched to end racial inequality and violence against men and women of color, especially those in the LGBTQ plus community. This one day after the Trump administration announced plans to roll back health care protections for the transgender community. The protest also coming on a weekend, which marks the four year anniversary of the mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. The night team Stephen Cavazos with the change local groups demand to see in this edition of South Texas Pride. Black Lives Matter. I have to fight two battles, not only being black, black also black being queer. Matter. Tristan Mays says it's a fight he's faced his whole life, black. being black and gay. But that's what brought him and others out to the Bear County Courthouse today. Protesters aim to shed light on the discriminations men and women of color face, particularly those within the LGBTQ plus community. You're not only discriminated because of your skin color that you can't change, and you're also discriminated because of your sexuality, which you also can't change. Then he shared their stories of adversity and their hope for acceptance, a message May says has never been more important. My existence has to be respected. My trans people have to be respected because we're all human beings at the end of the day. But this diverse community has seen its fair share of challenges over the years. In 2017, Kenny McFadden a black trans woman was found dead in the San Antonio River. The medical examiner ruled her death as a homicide. Didi Decor, a black trans woman, says McFadden's death was a significant loss. I felt like I also lost a sister because I came to know her and she taught me a lot. She says violence against trans women of color is as real as their lack of equality. Recently, the Trump administration announced it's stripping away health care protections for transgender men and women opening the door for further discrimination. Decor says it was the final insult. It's a disrespect, you know, it's a spit in the face. But she says it's just one of the many reasons why all black lives should matter. And she hopes others are willing to listen. Try to educate yourself and get to know what that person's story is. Now again, yesterday did mark four years since a deadly shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. 49 people lost their lives after a gunman opened fire. And over here at Crockett Park, a small candlelight vigil was held to honor the lives lost due to acts of violence. Now, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg was also present. He does tell us that San Antonio will not be known as a place of inequality. Tim, Courtney. Stephen Cavazos reporting live for us tonight. Thank you. A different kind of protest happening at the Alamo today. Dozens rallying against a plan to relocate the Alamo Cenotaph. The Alamo master plan proposed by the state calls for the cenotaph to be moved 500 feet south of where it is now. Those who oppose the plan say it interferes with the Alamo's history. The majority of the people in Texas have no idea that the Defenders Monument is going to be moved off of the battlefield. And there is no reason given except it's in the way. It has to be repaired. So we can only repair it by moving it, which makes no sense. Uh, and, and there's no other reason to move the monument. Cenotaph was built in 1939 as a memorial to those who fought during the Battle of the Alamo. Outside with live cam sitting at 80 degrees at the airport. What an awesome June night across South Texas downtown looking great under clear skies and yeah, it's still warm out there. But it is not muggy, as has been the case for the past several days, and that's just made it feel so comfortable out there. Even though high temperatures today were in the mid to upper 90s for some of us. High temperature at the airport in San Antonio, 92. But Del Rio, you got up to 99 this afternoon, and 95 was the high temperature today in Carrizo Springs. It will be warm, but pretty dry again on Sunday. However, muggy air will be returning probably a bit sooner than you would like. I'll let you know when you can expect uh, that mugginess to return. And do we have any rain in the forecast? We'll talk about all of that and more coming up in just a few minutes. Still to come on the night beat, a grave forecast from the CDC this weekend. Officials estimating some 25,000 more deaths before the 4th of July holiday. Plus, President Donald Trump addresses the graduating class at West Point. His speech coming at a time when both current and former military leaders debate the use of troops on U.S. soil. And following weeks of protests sparked by the death of George Floyd, Atlanta's police chief stepping down after a black man is killed by an officer overnight. That story is next.
The chief of the Atlanta Police Department has stepped down after calls for her resignation following an officer involved shooting there overnight. A black man shot and killed by officers during an attempted arrest in a Wendy's parking lot. This coming after weeks of protests demanding police reform in the city. ABC's Rena Roy has the story. Authorities in Georgia are scouring through videos of a violent struggle that turned deadly outside of Wendy's in Atlanta Friday night when officials say police shot and killed 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks after he allegedly resisted arrest. I don't want anyone in any circumstances to rush to any form of judgment. It's very easy to do in these cases on either side. We realize there's a tremendous amount of emotion. Officers were called to the parking lot around 10.30 p.m. with complaints of Brooks asleep in his car blocking the drive through Police claim he failed a sobriety test and that when they tried to arrest him, he resisted and was able to grab an officer's taser. In this surveillance video, you can see him running away, then appearing to point the taser at the officers. At that point, the Atlanta officer reaches down and retrieves his weapon from his holster, discharges it, strikes Mr. Brooks there on the parking lot, and he goes down. Today, Atlanta Police Chief Erica Shields stepping down after calls for her resignation as protesters demand police reform and racial justice. Chief Shields has offered to immediately step aside as police chief so that the city may move forward with urgency in rebuilding the trust so desperately needed throughout our communities. Demonstrators gathering near the fast food restaurant, their rally cries even louder now. It fueled a fire, a worse fire. We've been doing all this pro peaceful protesting, and in the midst of that, you guys are still killing us. Meanwhile, cities all over the U.S. are seeing their third weekend of mass protests over the death of George Floyd. Tensions rising in places like Nashville and Seattle, where demonstrators have seized control of some areas, claiming them as autonomous zones. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation is working with Atlanta's district attorney's office to determine if improper force was used. But the mayor of Atlanta says she does not believe the shooting was justified and is calling for the officer to be fired. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Back here at home, turning to the weather, it has been a very nice stretch and 80 degrees. Probably pretty comfortable out there right now. Yeah, it has been for a couple days now just because it's been drier. It's been so nice. Oh, it's so nice. And this is definitely not normal for <laughs> June. So I hope you've been able to enjoy it. We've got another pretty nice day coming up tomorrow before, excuse me, before that humidity really starts to roll You're upset back. About it. And yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news here. I love this live cam shot. Downtown looks great this evening, sitting right at 80 degrees under clear skies. There's that dew point that has been our magic number for the past several days. Our dew point numbers have generally been in the 40s and 50s. And when we think of it being really humid and muggy outside, these numbers are in the upper 60s, pushing low 70s sometimes. So those numbers have been much lower. It's been nice and dry out there. That has helped to warm us up in the afternoons. We've been in the 90s for the past few days, but it's also helped to cool us down just to touch more overnight and through the early morning hours. And we'll see that again tomorrow. We're going to start off in the 60s. And I really think the morning hours, that's where you can really just appreciate that drier air because it's cool. It's not humid. Our mornings have been great for the past few days, and we'll start you off tomorrow morning. 67 in San Antonio, low 60s in the Hill Country, under clear skies and with some drier air. We get into Monday. Temperatures come up a few degrees for the mornings, and then next week we'll be back closer to the low 70s. And then that's also when that humidity will really start to pick back up. So next couple of mornings, Things will be looking pretty good, especially tomorrow morning. But by Tuesday morning, sitting near 70 degrees, and you're really going to feel that humidity a lot more when you step out the door by Tuesday. So if you want to get out early tomorrow morning, take the dogs for a walk. It'll be another very pleasant morning. 67 first thing there. Clear skies all through the morning hours. By 9 o'clock, we'll be in the mid-70s, so starting to warm up. But I can't stress this enough. If you want to get out and take the dogs for a walk, do it early in the day tomorrow because once we get into the afternoon, while it will still be nice, that pavement is just going to be too hot for their paws tomorrow afternoon. I was looking on a website called fourpaws.com uh, or .org. They're an animal protection uh, group, and they cite that when temperatures, when air temperatures get above the mid to upper 80s, the pavement readings can be as high as 140 degrees plus, and that's just too hot for their paws. So if you want to get out uh, for a walk, enjoy the crisp 
kind of cooler morning hours that we'll have for you tomorrow. Here's a look at our dew point temperatures right now. Again, mid 50s here in San Antonio, some 40s off to the west of 35. But I want to show you how these numbers will be changing over the next couple of days and why that muggy feeling will return. So tomorrow our wind remains a bit more easterly that will keep the air a little bit drier. But as we get into Monday, Wind direction will become more southeasterly off the Gulf of Mexico. These dew point numbers will really start to climb. And then look what happens by Tuesday morning. We've got dew points about 20 degrees higher from where they are right now with the wind off the Gulf of Mexico. Once that muggy air really starts to settle in Tuesday morning, it's going to hang with us uh, for the rest of next week. Now, if it's going to be muggy, can we at least get some rain to go along with that muggy feel? Not necessarily. Our upper level weather pattern is keeping the heat high pretty close to us here in Texas. It's actually keeping the central portion of the country very dry this weekend and into the first part of next week. So this is going to hang pretty close to us and that's going to keep any of those upper level lows that would generally produce some rain away from us well to the north and well to the east. So looks like through the start of next weekend, your forecast will be rain free with humidity again really starting to build back in by Tuesday. Tuesday with the return of that muggy air. That's also when we'll bring back the morning clouds, but then we'll see some afternoon sunshine. So a bit more cloud cover here through the start of next weekend. Tomorrow flag day. It's going to be a really nice day. I hope you're able to get out and enjoy guys. At least it's only mid 90s. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> We're not on meltdown alert yet. <laughs> All right, turning now to uh, Larry in sports and a uh, current Longhorn player as well as a uh, former Steel standout, mm -hmm. adding his voice to calls for change. Yes, Caden Stearns, we all know, is a great football player at high school and at the college level, but he's turning into quite the leader off the field. He wants change in the world and on the campus of UT. Plus, J.J. Watt responds to a tweet about kneeling during the national anthem. Coming up. See all this? You're like, I have to protect myself. I can't wait on them to protect me. I see what they're doing. They don't give two about us. George Hill is speaking his mind when it comes to police brutality in the aftermath of George Floyd's death in big board sports. Milwaukee Bucks guard and Indianapolis native George Hill joined leaders in the Indiana sports community to discuss racism in America and the death of George Floyd. The former Spurs guard got emotional, shedding tears, saying he's seen police brutality and he's seen the killing going on. Last year around this time, a cousin of his was shot 16 times by a cop and Hill said he watched him lay there for 90 minutes before another officer got there and that scares Hill. You plus to look at those people as protectors. You don't have that. You plus to look at all these situations as learning lessons, but you're like, when do we, like, when is learning enough? When is it enough? Like, when are we going to be tired of this? How do we change the narrative? So for me, it, it's just tough. Like, it, that's a hard question when everyone says, just shut up and dribble. No, I'm not going to shut up and dribble. I don't care if you take my contract. I don't care if you say that I'm this, I'm that. I'm human. I, I have a heart. I have a pulse. I have emotions. I'm a man. I have kids. I'm a father. I have a wife. Like I have friends. I have loved ones. So it, it means to me, I'm not going to just shut up and dribble. Tomorrow, Hill and many others will be marching in downtown Indianapolis in hopes of making a change and to let their voices be heard. Last week, Texas head football coach Tom Herman and around 50 of his players marched from the campus to the Capitol in Austin with Austin police officers to protest police brutality and racism in the country. Players locked arms during the march and police officers joined the players in taking a knee in front of the Capitol for nine minutes to honor George Floyd. Herman said we've got to be the agents of change. Steel alum and Horn star Caden Stearns agrees 100%. I think it starts with education first. Um, because there's a lot of it there and it, it is deep rooted in, in, into this country of of this oppression that the black community has has been facing and it, it starts there and then it starts with self-reflecting and checking yourself really like have do i have any hate in my heart and if you do then get it out of there um and have conversations be open-minded and and open and open your heart um because Again, nothing's going to be done if there's no unity and understanding one another. 
Texas athletes are pushing for changes to the campus to make it more inclusive to the black community. In a tweet, Caden called on further action from administrators and called for his fellow students to do their part to help create that change. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. J.J. Watt's Twitter page is blowing up today after the Texans defensive star responded to a person who tweeted that he was pretty sure Watt would not be taking a knee during the national anthem. That tweet was deleted, but not before J.J. replied saying, A, don't speak for me, and B, if you still think it's about disrespecting the flag or our military, you clearly haven't been listening. Now, some are on J.J.'s side, while other on Twitter's are blasting him saying kneeling is disrespectful. Now JJ's tweet comes one day after Texans head coach and general manager Bill O'Brien says he will join his players if they kneel during the national anthem this coming season to protest racial inequality and police brutality. He said, quote, yeah, I'll take a knee. I'm all for it. The players have a right to protest, a right to be heard, and a right to be who they are. They're not taking a knee because they're against our flag. They're taking a knee because they haven't been treated equally in this country for over 400 years, end quote. And the PGA Tour is back. Third round action from Fort Worth. No fans on the course, but... There's some fans right they across a parking of, lot. Of you they built like some Wrigley Field stands Those in, a, were in, a, amazing. In, a back, in the backyard of a guy, and they were watching the tournament. Fan goals. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, you got it. We'll be right back. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has a grim forecast on how many deaths we could see in the U.S. by the 4th of July. In addition to new CDC guidelines for everyone, which include wearing a mask and avoid large gatherings, here's ABC's Zoreen Shaw with the details. With the U.S. death toll from COVID-19 now at nearly 115,000, the CDC with a grim prediction saying as many as 25,000 more Americans could die from the virus by July 4th. Amid continued protests following the death of George Floyd and news that President Trump will once again be holding campaign rallies, the CDC publishing new guidelines urging people to wear masks and saying the places with the highest risk are large in-person gatherings where attendees travel from outside the local area. Some states now pulling back after beginning to ease restrictions. In Utah, reopening plans put on hold for a week by the governor. After Oregon logged its single highest daily number of cases, reopening plans paused for a week there as well. This is essentially a statewide yellow light. In neighboring Washington state, Yakima County accounts for just 3% of the population, but nearly half the new cases this week. And surprisingly, 50% of those confirmed cases are people under 40 years old. Another hot spot, Arizona, Yuma County with a disturbing increase in cases. Officials there urging everyone to follow those CDC guidelines. But Texas still moving forward, allowing restaurants at 75 percent capacity, even as the state's hospitalization rate has jumped 42 percent since Memorial Day. Some people don't know that the coronavirus is not gone and they're treating it like it's gone. Florida confirming 2,581 cases on Saturday, a 35% increase over what had been the state's single day high of 1,902 cases reported on Friday. As Miami beaches reopened this weekend, the city's mayor expressing concern. I always said when we started opening that there were two paths, the path of responsibility and the path of irresponsibility. And unfortunately, we're starting to see behavior that concerns me deeply. Dr. Anthony Fauci telling ABC News, we will get through this. This will end. It will end with a combination of public health measures and ultimately science coming in and getting durable solutions, such as treatments and vaccines. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Meanwhile, there's a new concern about the coronavirus, which has researchers worried, and that would be mutation. Analysts at the Scripps Research Institute in Florida say a mutation they've discovered affects the spike protein, which is the outer coating of the virus that helps it get into cells. This new mutation could make it easier for the virus to infect human cells. More research is needed, but some experts worry this could alter how the pandemic plays out. But last week, the World Health Organization said Mutations had not made the virus more transmissible. Uh, transmissible. The WHO also said mutations discovered so far would not affect how the vaccines that are now in development would work. 
New details today about two Navy pilots killed in Wednesday's plane crash in Alabama. According to Pensacola Naval Air Station, Captain Vincent Seegers and Commander Joshua Fuller were flying a Navy aircraft to Pensacola when the plane went down near a small airport in Selma. The Navy says the two pilots were decorated naval officers who served in Afghanistan and received more than a dozen ribbons and medals. Seegers was the commanding officer of the Naval Aviation School Command at NAS Pensacola and had served nearly 30 years as a naval officer. Fuller was two weeks away from his 20 year mark of service as an officer. Officials believe there were no other passengers on board the plane Wednesday. Authorities are still investigating the cause of the crash. The group behind the Oscars says it has a plan to make the awards more inclusive. The Academy of uh, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences says its new initiative is called Academy Aperture 2025. Phase one of the plan will focus on governance, mem membership and workplace culture. The Academy and the Producers Guild of America also plan to develop inclusive industry standards. The changes come after years of criticism that the Oscars are dominated by Caucasians and men. The Academy also updated its policy for the best picture category. It says it will have a set 10 nominees per year, starting with the award show in 2021. You became brothers and sisters, pledging allegiance to the same timeless principles to protect our country, to defend our people, and to carry on the traditions of freedom, equality, and liberty. President Trump today delivering a commencement speech to the graduating class of 2020 at West Point Academy. The address comes amid growing tensions between the White House and the military over the president's threats to deploy active duty forces to control protests in America. The administration faced backlash when peaceful protesters were aggressively removed for the president's photo op outside St. John's Episcopal Church right near the White House. President Trump's top military advisor, General Mark Milley, has since apologized for walking with the president across Lafayette Park for that photo. Some of the nation's most respected retired military officers have also condemned the incident, including former Defense Secretary General Jim Mattis. President Trump's first rally since the pandemic began is getting a new date following backlash online. The president announced on Twitter he is delaying his campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma now because of Juneteenth. Juneteenth take pla takes place on June 19th and celebrates the emancipation of slaves. The Trump campaign rally was also originally set for June 19th, which led to the controversy and criticism. Yesterday, the president tweeted his African-American friends and supporters asked him to change the date. And out of respect for the holiday, he has moved his rally to Saturday, June 20th. Still ahead, as home values rise, thousands of appraisal protests are expected here in Bear County. But the process has changed. What you need to know, coming up next. Well, if you take issue with your new property value, you're not alone. Despite job losses and business closings, home values are mostly up. The Bear Appraisal District is expecting more than 100,000 protests. That includes you. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz shows us how the process is a little different this year. It all begins to the right people. David Savios is dropping his protest at the Bear Appraisal District's front door. His 1940s Jefferson home is appraised 23% higher than last year. Of course we have an issue with that, but according to them, they said those, those appraisals were done in January. Before the economy tanked, but state law requires appraisals be the property's value on January 1st. So far, the appraisal district has seen about 75,000 protests filed. It's going to look a little different this year. For one thing, the doors are locked. But we're trying to find ways to work smarter to keep the public safe. So property owners should file their protests online or by mail or use this drop box. The informal back and forth will be handled by phone or email. Chief Appraiser Mike Amesquita says they are offering settlements on the lower end of a property's range of value. But if you still aren't satisfied, there's the formal hearing, 2020 style. You can have what's an equivalent of a Zoom meeting if you're not comfortable coming in, but it is something that is required if you ask for it, for us to provide you an in-person hearing. So with plenty of plexiglass and big screens, they are preparing for in-person hearings that likely won't happen until after August. For
For most of the half million property owners whose values jumped, the deadline to file notice of protest is June 29th. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Taking a look outside with live cam, really nice night out there. Clear skies, light wind, sitting right at 80 degrees, so it is warm, but like we've been talking about for the past few days, it is not humid out there, and that has made the past few days just really enjoyable. It was hot this afternoon, though. Low 90s here in San Antonio, mid to upper 90s, off to the west of 35, and plenty of heat building across Texas today. Mid 90s, high temperatures up in the Panhandle, 93 the high in Dallas, 94 in Abilene this afternoon. It will be another warm day tomorrow, but humidity staying on the lower side for just one more day. So I want you to go ahead and carve out a little bit of outdoor time tomorrow and soak it all in because as we get into early next week, that mugginess returns. We're also going to take a look at what's going on in the tropics coming up next in the full forecast. Eventually, reality is going to smack us in the face like a wet towel, and it's it's on the horizon, right? Yes, yes. Tomorrow kind of is really our last day where you'll notice that drier air, especially in the morning. So I do want you to go ahead and really soak it in as we get into the day tomorrow, because by early next week, especially Tuesday, you'll feel that mugginess a lot more. Before we jump into our forecast here in South Texas, I do want to give you an update on what's going on out in the tropics. Hurricane season is underway, and here's a look at the Tropical satellite view over the Atlantic Basin. Uh, no tropical cyclones out there at this time. And in fact, according to the National Hurricane Center, uh, no tropical development expected in the next two to even five days. So a bit of a lull in activity out in the Atlantic Basin. Don't think anyone's necessarily uh, complaining about that, but something that can sometimes hinder tropical development out in the Atlantic, that's something called the Saharan air layer. So what I'm showing you here is a look at the Saharan dust forecast. And if you just kind of went, ugh, or groaned, yes, this is something we see this time of year as we get into the summer months in hurricane season. It is a layer of Saharan dust from the continent of Africa that gets picked up by the trade winds in the Atlantic Ocean and gets pushed over into the Caribbean, sometimes even the Gulf of Mexico, and sometimes even our great state of Texas. And as we get into next week, it looks like the trade winds will begin to push some of the Saharan dust into the Caribbean by about Tuesday, and then sneaking into the Gulf of Mexico and getting closer to Texas as we get into the end of next week, start of next weekend. But you'll notice here as I look at our uh, legend there, it's going to be on the lighter side. So the concentrations of this dust, these very, very fine particulates, it's going to be on the lighter side there. But when we get this coming in here, even if it is on the lighter side, it can be very irritating for some people, and it can almost be like an allergen. It irritates your eyes, may give you a headache, something like that. So we could be looking at our first little batch of Saharan dust late next week and into the start of next weekend. So that is something to consider, and of course, we'll keep you updated there. We're going to switch back over to uh, talking about what's going on here in South Texas this week. So uh, we'll have another nice couple of days for you tomorrow, even on Monday, humidity staying on the lower side, but then it picks back up Tuesday. And as we get into late next week, start of next weekend, it will still be warm out there. Not incredibly hot, which is good. We're staying away from the triple digits for now, but we'll have that mugginess to contend with, and that could bring the heat index back into play as we get into next weekend. For right now, let's enjoy this beautiful night. It looks great out there. 80 degrees, dew point in the 50s. That's what's keeping it from feeling too muggy. And across South Texas, generally upper 70s, low to mid 80s. Still at 87 there in Del Rio. 81 right now in Catula, 72 up in Kerrville. But these are the numbers that we've really been enjoying the past few days. Dew points now in the 40s and the 50s. A few spots down on the coastal bend in the low to mid 60s. But you guys, sometimes your numbers are in like the upper 70s, pushing 80. So even low to mid 60s is pretty good there close to the Gulf of Mexico. Our winds this evening generally out of the east at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. We will start to see our wind direction take a turn to the southeast off the Gulf late tomorrow into Monday. And that's what gradually brings these dew point numbers up from pleasant territory where we are right now 
into the upper 60s and low 70s. So again, it's by Tuesday morning on those dew points back in the low 70s. And that's when I think when you step out the door Tuesday morning, that muggy air is really going to hit you. Not tomorrow, though. Another nice morning. We'll see plenty of sun again tomorrow. A few fair weather clouds. It is flag day tomorrow. A little bit of a breeze uh, in the afternoon tomorrow. 93 your high temperature under mostly sunny skies. Mostly sunny again on Monday, but with the return of that humidity Tuesday, I also expect us to have those morning clouds building back in and we'll see that really each day through the end of next week. Morning clouds, afternoon sun and a bit more in the way of humidity. Summer officially begins next Saturday afternoon and then of course we have Father's Day to look forward to and I'll have a early look at that forecast for you tomorrow evening. Guys, thanks so much Katie. Two local guys get calls from the MLB. This area has a lot of talented baseball players, and I think it's really coming to the forefront in the past four or five years. Like Tim said, two locals drafted by Major League Baseball, Jordan Westberg and Asa Lacey. Plus, the Flying Chonclas are getting ready to play some ball out at the Wolf. Coming up. With the 30th overall selection Wednesday night, the Baltimore Orioles drafted Mississippi State shortstop Jordan Westberg. The New Braunfels High School product was ranked the 37th best product by MLB.com. He's back home staying in shape while waiting for baseball to hopefully resume. My last few months have been kind of kind of crazy, just like everybody else's have been. Um, I've, I've moved back home here to New Braunfels, Texas, um, and I've just been – um, I'm blessed enough to have a cage in my backyard and, and we have a shed out back that has enough, um, you know, weight room equipment for me to be able to work out and stay in shape. Um, I've been able to throw with a few um, teammates of mine and, um, you know, I've been able to do everything that I need to do to stay in baseball shape. And um, I know that just trying to stay healthy is the biggest thing for me and, and getting ready to take the next step whenever that may be um, is what I'm looking forward to. Tyvee High School alum Asa Lacey was taken fourth overall by the Kansas City Royals. He's the top rated pitcher in this year's draft class by MLB.com. And the Texas A&M star can't wait for baseball to start back up as he continues to pursue his major league dream. I can't wait. Um, you know, I, I definitely know I have a, you know, a road ahead of me and it's not going to be an easy one. And I'm going to have to adapt. And, uh, you know, I still, I still have room to improve. And so I'm really looking forward just to really going through that process with my teammates and in the Royals organization. Baseball is returning to the Wolf. The San Antonio Missions are hosting a team this summer in the 2020 Texas Collegiate League. The team will play as the Flying Chanclas. The league comprises 10 total teams made up of active college players, sophomores to seniors from different colleges and universities across the nation. Flying Chanclas President Burl Yarbrough is pumped. Man, I feel like we've been living in a hole, you know, and so for us to finally be able to put the Texas Collegiate thing together, uh, we're all so pumped about being able to open the gates here in a few weeks. You know, we've all been sitting in these nice ballparks and, uh, you know, the field's beautiful, ready to go, and uh, so we were, you know, all looking for, for, for opportunity, and uh, Texas Collegiate League's going to give that to us this year. Each team will play 30 games, 15 home, 15 away. The Flying Chanclas will play at home July 3rd through the 5th with the Cane Coders out of Louisiana. Take you to Fort Worth now for the third round of the Charles Schwab Challenge at Colonial Country Club. Dallas native Jordan Speed sinks this long distance putt on eight for birdie, taking him to 12 under. He's in contention just one shot back. Justin Thomas is right there with Spieth, 17th hole, par four. Thomas' approach shot is money, hits the green and spins back for a birdie putt, which he'd make, moving him to 12 under par. Five guys are one shot back of leader Xander Shoffley, who takes the lead on the 18th hole with that birdie putt right there. So Shoffley sits at 13 under par, 197, heading into the final round. Tomorrow he has a one shot lead on five guys, including Spieth. Very crowded atop that leaderboard. Also crowded in that guy's backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great setup, isn't it? It is. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. We used up all of our words, so that means that's all of our time for tonight. Thanks for watching. Be sure to catch GMSA tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.